Before starting, I wanted to start with Joshua 24, verses 14. It says, Now the fear of the Lord, and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away to God your ancestors' worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, and whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Men and women of God tonight, we too say, we and our households will serve the Lord. Fathers, as the spiritual head of your families, you are called to lead. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them. And when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And may I add, impress them on the hearts of our children. Last week I spoke about the husband as being the spiritual head. Tonight I would like to focus on being the spiritual head as a father. Again, let me preface what I'm about to say. First, I'm no expert. But I do have experience with two daughters now being in their 20s. And I know that for most of you, your children are grown up and you have families outside the home now. But, and this is a but you need to hear, a church, as a church, any child that comes into those doors is a part of the family of God. In other words, whether we have children living with us or not, we are still responsible to all of God's children that are in his church. Before I start, I'd like to open up in prayer, though. Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, we know, Lord, we can do nothing in our own strength. And if we do such, Lord, it does not glorify you. So I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come upon each of us, Lord, and give us insight to how we can honor you more as fathers, as leaders of your families, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's see if this works now. Boom. Yeah. The role God assigns to men as being the spiritual head as a father starts with the relationship we have with our wives. So I said from last week, all eyes are on you, especially the little ones. It is those times that we least expect it that those little ones see us doing something or hear us say something we should not be doing or saying. And they will bring it to a remembrance when we catch them doing the same. Godly fathers of today and yesterday and the future are called to do the following. One, to fear the Lord. We as fathers must display a holy reverence to our Heavenly Father. By doing such, we provide our children with a place of refuge. They should feel safe around you and secure to come to you no matter what. Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and His children will have a place of refuge. We are also required to teach our children God's Word. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Next we are also called to administer discipline. Proverbs 3.11.12 says My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction for whom the Lord loves he corrects just as the father the son in whom he delights. And Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. 
We are called to not provoke our children to wrath, and that's Ephesians 6, 4. And lastly, so far we are called to leave an internal inheritance for our children. Proverbs 13, 22 says that. Our aim is to usher in our children to be part of God's family forever. For me, that is my greatest desire for my family, that internal inheritance that they too will be in heaven together with our families. So as spiritual heads, we fathers are called to minister to the hearts of our children. Our ultimate goal is to develop a love for the Lord and our children that surpasses ours. We want them to take ownership of their faith they have for Christ. It is no longer dad's religion, but my religion. We want to hear from their lips. We want them to feel that it is their religion and not something that is given to them that they have to show because they're in a family. But we want them to take that ownership of their religion. Okay. It's not working. Oh, well. Next, when we discipline, and we will, it is a way God has given us to disciple the hearts of our children, to be in subjection to him. Notice a disciple. When we punish, we're addressing the behavior only. But when we discipline, our aim is to see a change in behavior as a result of the discipline. The question that we ask is, how do we win their hearts? First and foremost, we need to lead by example. Daily, we need to give to them our very hearts. There is a love in the Old Testament that is called Hesed love. It's a love where one empties himself for the welfare of others. This is the type of love we need to display to our children. It does not mean we give them the free reign to do whatever they want, though. For this would not be love. But it's a love that is demonstrated by patience, grace, mercy, and a dedication over time. This means we'll be giving up things we desire to do. When my wife and I first got married, we were told that the first thing we would come to realize is what a selfish pig we were. Once we adjusted and learned to give of ourselves to each other, we thought we were done. Then the first child came. Then the second child came. And you know what? We discovered that we had a long way to go with being so self-centered. And once we learn to be that servant that I talked about last week, life does get better. And believe it or not, God blesses you even more. Our goal as spiritual heads as fathers is to plant seeds of faith into our children's heart. We want them to have passion for truth and goodness. We want their dreams to be fulfilled in Christ. And lastly, we want to instill in them a confidence and capacity to serve God faithfully. So let me see if I can get these to move on a little bit here. There we go. Uh, I feel like I'm playing a video game for you guys right now. <laughs> well, click it for me and I'll tell you when you can get there, okay? <clears throat> our goal as spiritual fathers is to plant seeds of faith in our children's heart. We want them to have a passion for truth and goodness. We want their dreams to be filled in Christ. And lastly, we want to instill them a confidence and capacity to serve God faithfully. To do this, we need a game plan. Face it. As guys, we always want a game plan. We always think of sports. And our game plan consists of four things. One, we need to read God's Word. As I said last week, we need to be in the Word. And us being in the Word should be recognized and known by all in the family. God's word is to be read and meditated upon. Scripture verses should be memorized, and you should be able to articulate your faith to your children. They will have questions. Be that Berean, and be prepared to have an answer to the faith that is in you. Second, we begin, as I said last week, we need to be men of prayer. Remember what we want to achieve in our children are those qualities that are treasured the most. We want them to take ownership of these means of grace and to apply them even better than us in their lives. We are training our next generation for a battle. We need to not only show them the armor of God, but show them how to put it on and how to use it. Give them times to practice prayer and be that encourager for them. 
Praise goes a long way. Number three is to, is to develop a work ethic in them. Do jobs together around the house. Then gradually give them jobs they can do on their own. Remember to encourage them and praise them for the jobs they do. But you want them to do a job and to do it right on their own. Help them to achieve a work they and you would be proud of. Again, leading by example is the best way to do this. Assign them simple chores in the beginning as they get older, the complexity of the tax should increase. And lastly, our game plan must have a time of play. This varies with age and with the gender of your child, but a child needs to learn from you how to play. There is nothing wrong with a competitive nature, but it should never consume the individual. Playtime should be fun. And that's your goal, for them to relax and enjoy. But there's a word of warning. And the word, word of warning is this. Although it's never too late to start, realize it's best to start as soon as possible in your child's life. Your opportunity to reach your child's heart diminishes day by day the more you put it off. And that's something that you don't want to look back at. If you have families that you know of, you have your sons and daughters with families, stress them the importance of having that spiritual head in the family. If they're single moms raising families, the same goes for them. They too need to realize it starts now. You can't put it off. You can't put it back on the back burner. Next, discipline is probably the hardest and most time-consuming part of being a leader, a father. It says in Ephesians 6, 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So first, pray for wisdom as you set boundaries for your children. Be present in their lives. Do not let your work or other things keep you from being a part of their lives. Less things, less money may mean more time to be there for them when it really counts. I'm a school teacher. And I see this daily. The kids come and they say, I say, what would you do this weekend? Nothing. Their families aren't doing things together anymore. And it's sad to see that. Remember those days in which the dad would take the son or daughter to go and do something, go to the park and things like that. That's not happening any longer. We need, as Christian families, to show people this is what families are about. So men... Prioritize your lives. Ask yourself, are you becoming too busy to be a father? If the answer is yes, you may need to change how you are now doing things. Under Christ, we are the spiritual heads of the family. And every facet of the home, the father's presence should be felt in discipline and worship and by way of gentle love. A child should know who is in charge and can rest assured that he or she is safe because of this. Remember that training and discipline means more than simply discipline or punishment for wrongdoing. You don't want to wait till it's needed. Be proactive in setting limits and be that example for them to imitate. Next slide. Leadership as a family. The next part I'd like to get into is, okay, as a family, where do we lead? And the first part we want to look at is on the next slide there, and it says, we will now look at where a father needs to take the initiative as it relates to a family. Let's look at the idyllic family. I'll call it the Leave it the Beaver family, that father that I grew up with. Remember that one? Everything was perfect. Everything was perfect. First, the father is the one that needs to set down the ground rules for discipline. Discipline, not just for offenses that occur, but for ones that may occur. As fathers, we need to be the ones that say, let's pray. Let's talk. Let's do Bible time now. Your wife should be able to look to you to be the one that initiates things. Another area the husband needs to be the spiritual leader is with finances. God calls us to be good stewards of what he gives us. Guys, we may not be the ones that write the checks, but we need to be involved in where the money goes. 
the husbands should feel a special responsibility also to lead the family and a daily pattern of prayer. One thing I would suggest is that you set aside each day a specific thing to pray for. For example, and this is what we have done in my family for years. On Mondays, we pray for missionaries. Tuesday, a family member. Wednesday, a specific person. Thursday, the church. Friday, the country. Saturday's open prayer. And Sunday, we all pray for each other. Now, it doesn't matter what you choose to do, but pray together. Teach your children how to pray. That's the important part. So when they get into situations, they can pray with other people. We also need to develop in them a daily pattern of daily Bible reading. As they grow older, help them to go from that milk to the meat. For they too will be even better than what you are and trying to imitate to them. And lastly, spiritually, we need to enforce weekly worship with church attendance and a good solid youth group to get involved in. Next slide, please. As a spiritual leader for our children, we need to be aware of what they are doing. In there, what they see in here. And these are things I want to talk about. Lately, I've been listening to the radio. I don't know if you listen to Focus on the Family on the radio and stuff. And they've been talking about what's happening to our generation right now with entertainment, TV, movies, internet, video games, and music. I've seen kids now so hooked on their cell phones that they have withdrawal syndromes, just like a drug, in which you take it away from them and they get to the point they get shakes and everything else, and it's scary. I had girls break down in class when I'd taken their phone away. This is the type of thing. It's no longer stop taking drugs, but stop taking that technology that's changing you. They're finding with technology, it's changing the, the parts of your brain and everything else and causing our brains to decay even rapidly. And that's a scary thing. Video games, the kids, the reality has changed. They're looking at video games these days and looking at these video games. They don't know what's right and wrong any longer. They're killing and they're murdering and things like that. And this is what they're doing for fun. When they see people being killed on TV, on a news report, and the next minute there's a commercial of little dancing bears and everything else, they can't tell the difference. We need to be there to guide them. We need to monitor what they're doing. So if we don't monitor what they're doing, we're going to lose them. The other thing we need to look at is on this is that you need to know their friends. You need to know who they're hanging out with. Know the friends' families. Get to know them. All these things are important in the lives of a, of a father or of a mother if she's raising her children by themselves or grandparents if you're raising kids. Don't put your, bury your head in the sand on this because that's how you'll lose them. And you have to be able to look and know what they're doing. Next, know what they're being taught at school. I say this as a school teacher. There are things being taught at school that you should be aware of. We had things last year at an assembly in which they were very explicit on sexual things. And it was sad to hear this. Be aware of that. Ask your child, what are you learning today? And they say nothing. Ask again. In science classes, when they say you're an animals, you want to believe that, God doesn't say that in his word. We have to stand up and tell our children, no, what they're teaching you is not right. But also teach them a way to handle it. How do you approach a teacher? How do you say um, what your beliefs are without mocking or degrading a teacher in a classroom? So you have to give them ways in order to cope. Next. Help them to prioritize their lives. And what I mean by this, when I hear families and say, well, oh, this Sunday we can't go to church. We have a soccer game coming up. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have to realize what is that priority? The priority of our lives should be God first 
and we have to show it to them. Whether they be the star pitcher of the team, you say, sorry. God comes first in our lives. And at times it's going to hurt. But God didn't promise us that it's going to be easy. He did not promise us that. And next, on the next slide there. As a spiritual leader for our children, we need to be aware of what they are doing. Watch what you say, for they will always be listening. As it says in that slide there, a child's main classroom is what they overhear from their parents' conversation. They're the best spies we have. They can tell you every little detail. They listen. And I'm looking at three of them right here. I know. My daughters can tell us things that we didn't know we said. They'll help you recall. Our calling as fathers, on the next slide there, we are called to work the hearts of our children that they might be fertile soil for the gospel and devotion to Christ. And next, we are to keep and protect our children from the influence of sin in the world and in their own hearts. In the minutes remaining, I want to focus on the responsibility of leading in family worship. It's important to bring our family together to pray together, to read his word together, to spend time together, and to attend church together. So on this next slide here, what does family worship look like on a Sunday? First of all, preparation is all week long. You want church to be something they are looking forward to, not a drudgery, especially the night before. Don't stay up late. Early to bed the night before is is a must. A sense of awe should be there for them. A deep sense of the unknown and the mysterious can rise in the soul of a sensitive child in solemn worship. If his parents are going hard after God themselves. Remember the first time you played a sport? Let's say basketball. You picked up the ball and looked at the hoop, heaved it up in the air, and nothing but net, right? You got good at it and you thought you'd become, I'm going to be the next Michael, Kobe, or LeBron. You even got on a team. But then it got boring because you only knew one facet of the game. Then you learned the rules of the game, strategies, the meaning of defense, and teamwork. The game became more than just making hoops. For many of our children, we take them to church, and they are still making the shots. But they have not gone beyond this point. You too may have come to church with your parents, and that first church service was intriguing and somewhat exciting. It was new and different, but as time went on, the excitement faded away and you became bored. Playing on your iPhone seemed okay as you were doing the right thing and going to church. And one reason is you never went beyond being a spectator to being a participant in worship. Worship is not a spectator sport. Let me say that again. Worship is not a spectator sport. It's an active and vibrant experience. We must be able to show this to our children if we want them to be participants in worship and not just spectators. So how can we make sure that our children are part of the worship service? First and foremost, set the example of being a participant in the service. Click again. Point out before the service starts what the f- will be taking place. It's important for them to understand. First of all, the music. Show them in the program. Okay, these are the songs you're going to be singing today. They need to be a part of it. The prayer time. Explain to them, why is that person up here praying? What's the prayer about? What does it mean? Why do we have an offering? What's the purpose of the offering? They need to know. The more they know, the more they become part of the service. And even in the sermon, when you know what's going to be read, have their Bibles open, ready to be read. For they can look at that passage and you can read together and they can feel part of that service. And next, have them sit and stand with the rest of the congregation. If I can demand this out of my students in the classroom, you too can demand it at your kids. 
they're able to do it. And you know what? Once they learn it, they feel part of the congregation. And that's something we need to look at. Have them participate in singing. Don't get, I don't want to sing. Sing. It's not time to play. We're here to worship. And if we don't stress that to them, this is the moment that we're here for God and God alone. That's why we come into these doors here. We are here to worship. And we need to show that for our children and demand it out of them. They're able to do it. Believe me, if I can get a bunch of seventh graders to do what I need them to do, you can do the same for your kids, whether it be your grandkids or not. And during the sermon, if they can take notes, have a special book they can write in. And if they can, I mean, take notes, have them draw pictures of what's going on in the service. Remember, if they don't see you doing it, though, you can't expect them to do it. You have to set the example. And that means each and every one of us here, because we're all leaders amongst our children here in this church. Fathers, do not think just because you have your family in church on Sunday that you have met your obligation. That was only the first step. Praise and encourage the sense of worship your son or daughter exhibited in church when the service is over. Whether that be on the ride home from church or the time you spend in the family devotion, during the week, refer back to what was taught and challenge them to live by God's word. Next slide, please. It says on this one, children are a blessing from the Lord. As with all blessing, there is accountability. Fathers must realize that the Spirit gave this charge regarding our children to us. He did not give it to the mother, though their role is absolutely necessary and it's being carried out. He did not give it to the daycare. He did not give it to the babysitter, and he did not give it to those of us who can afford a nanny. Okay? He did not give it to the grandparents, nor did he give it to the church, the school, or the youth program. He gave it to the fathers. Therefore, fathers will bear the accountability, the consequence for failing to carry it out, or the reward for do so doing. Let us never forget, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And the next two things, i like to address the majority out here, right? We're mostly grandparents and families are grown up. So we say, what is our role here? Why am I here? I'd like to give you a charge here. It says in Titus 2, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, and love and patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient for their own husband, that the word of God may not be blaspheming. On the next slide, Likewise, exhort the young man to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one whose opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Men and women of Orangeburg, you are needed more than ever. You have two things we do not have, years of experience and with it wisdom. Please don't sit back and allow this next generation to make the same mistakes you made in the past, but guide us and disciple us to be his children. When each of us became part of God's family, our ties of our earthly family changed. In some cases, were severed. I look out there, Guillermo, Anna, Barbara, Manny, Mary, Martha, Pastor Stewart, all of you, all of you. You are the engine that must now fuel the hearts of this next generation. We are in a war for the lives of our families. Unfortunately, our army on earth has turned its leadership over to the privates, while the generals are either ignored or missing from the battle. We need you, the generals, to take back leadership God has entrusted to you. You are the living stones of his church. Men and women of Orsburg, please don't sit back and watch while the war gets even worse. 
In these last days, we need your expertise, your prayers, your wisdom, your counsel to guide us. Now is your time to shine. King David stayed back from the battle. Remember what happened to him. Let us learn not to do the same. Let our lives be a reflection of Christ onto all who come through those doors into his church. Amen.